This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be talking to Therese Giamarco. Now, when Therese was a young girl, she was in The Coming, or aka Burned at the Stake, a Burt I. Gordon uh, horror film that uh, was a huge staple on TV back in the day. Um, a really weird, unique, supernatural horror film um, about the Pilgrim days um, in in uh, Boston, Massachusetts, or or Salem, Massachusetts. I should say it's kind of a Salem witch trial takeoff, you know, about witches and stuff. Um, and she was in it with Susan Swift, and we're going to talk today about this movie. And um, she's an advocate of autism, and uh, she helps um, autistic kids act and, you know, directs theater and all of that stuff. And we're going to get into all that today. Um, she has a, I think it's a theater company or, or an organization or something called There You Go, There You Go Art Studios. And um, I, I love it when people are, are helping, you know, the um the disabled and, you know, the autistic and handicapped and what have you, because, you know, I, I was in special ed for 10 years, and I just love to see people trying to help and do what they can with it, and she's doing God's work is what she's doing. It's going to be a great conversation today. I cannot wait. I also got to m- mention she was in First Affair, a uh, TV movie with uh, Melissa Sue Anderson and Loretta Swit, which I watched on YouTube the other night. It was pretty interesting. A little cliched, but pretty interesting. I enjoyed it. So yeah, here is my interview with Therese Giamarco. Hey, Therese, welcome to the show. How are you tonight? I'm doing pretty good. How are you? Or should I say I'm doing well, if that's dramatic or something? I, How are uh, you? I am spectacular. This is a great honor. Thank you for taking the time tonight. Oh, it's my pleasure. Yeah, it didn't It didn't make a difference uh, if it was the 40th anniversary last year. I found out in some sources it came out in 1981, so it don't matter. <laughs> it was the 40th anniversary, really? So you're going to know more, you know, than I do about this film. So you're going to have to fill me in on <laughs> well, one source I had said it was 1982, and then another was 1981, so it don't matter if it's an anniversary or belated or not. So the the point is, we're here now. <laughs> That's true, and it must have been because I was only 16 yes. when I made the movie, um, and so it was, a, yeah, it was, yeah, at least, at least 81, yeah, could have been 82, could have taken that long for it to come out, that's for sure. So, going back in time, what age did you start gravitating toward acting? Oh, my gosh. I was... When, I'll tell you, my first acting experience was I was in The King and I, mm-hmm. and it was my friend Katie McConerty mm-hmm. who said, you know, instead of going to gymnastics camp this summer, do you want to audition for the summer theater, summer show? And I auditioned for the summer show, and I got in, and she didn't. <laughs> and that was that was when I first started doing it. It wasn't it wasn't like you know it was like somebody else's idea really that I ended up doing it, and I really enjoyed it. It was really lovely. Yeah, was, mm, was so I was like ten, I guess I was around ten. Yeah, so you you liked it right away, and you started doing community theater and school plays and all that. I did. Yes, I used to go and <coughs> excuse me. Amazing high school. We had this amazing director. His name was Richard Pines, and he was this really intense man that really took his job very seriously. And he would put on these wonderful shows. And mm-hmm. I remember, we liked that the, the 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 they were kids. I mean, they were high school kids who were in the show. I, I looked at them like they were movie stars. Yeah. And so when I got to perform with them, like in the summer shows, like oh, that was you know, so-and-so who was, you know, the lead in Sweet Charity, and, you know, that's the other guy who was in Anything Goes, and they were like movie stars to me, Um, because they, they, you know, they were really good productions. Um, So, yeah, I just, uh, 
and then, I, you know, I discovered that it was something that I could do and, you know, do fairly well, among other things. It was one thing, anyway, that I could do really well. And then I just, yeah, I got swept up in it. Got, I got the bug, you know, I guess you get. Yeah, so you were doing, like, um, a musical theater mostly? Yeah, it was mostly musical theater. Um <clears throat> I used to do, I worked in like, in the summers, I used to work in equity houses, you know, but I wasn't in Actors Equity in Autumn, so I moved to uh, New York. Um, but, um, yeah, it was, wait, what was the question again? So you did mostly musical theater. <laughs> yes, hmm. musical theater, yes. I, did, I didn't really do um, dramatic shows, no. It was, it was mostly musical theater, that was my, that was what I loved to do. Yeah. Nice. You're born and raised in I, born and raised in Boston. I was born and raised yeah, Framingham. Yep, I did. Mm. Um, and I attended Boston University for a short time, and then I got into an off Broadway show, which was actually we actually did there. Um, <coughs> me. We did it at Radcliffe. I remember, and I that was what was who was that? Guy? Hold on, I, there's somebody I have to ask a question. What was his name? Robert. Oh, Robert Downey Jr. I did a show with. With Robert, Robert Downey, Downey Jr. Jr. Yeah. Yeah. Was he a good guy? No, he yeah. wasn't at the time. <laughs> the time he was, he was, he did a lot of cocaine. Smart. <laughs> I'm sure he wouldn't mind. Yeah. He's going to hear the podcast ever, but I, I uh, he was a, he was a little bit of a ding dong. He was a ding dong. <laughs> to put it yeah. <laughs> I've heard um, every story you could possibly imagine. Funny. Yeah. Sorry? I've heard every story about him you could possibly imagine, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very talented, but, uh, yeah, he wasn't my, wasn't my type. I was a bit of a square. I still am. <laughs> uh, so I wasn't really, he wasn't really, he wasn't interested in me, that's for sure. <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't a party animal. But he looks like he got his life straightened out quite a bit, so i got to give him credit. Or his wife. I think she helped him. Absolutely. So, how does uh, the the coming, aka burned at the stake, come into your life? <laughs> so, um, yeah. So after all of that, I, I at some point I got into um, uh, a cat. I, I met. Well, my aunt. My aunt was like she was well in the theater. Anita, my aunt Anita, she used to do a lot of theater in the Boston area, and she. Uh, had me meet her casting director, her agent, not her agent, not her casting director, her agent, Ann Baker. I wonder if Ann Baker is still around. Mm -hmm. Ann Baker Casting. She was like one of these, she was a big casting director in Boston. And mm -hmm. um, I had auditioned. I'd done like just some PSAs and uh, some other like local TV stuff around in the area and then she had me audition for the movie and this is a bit of trivia mm -hmm. well, not really trivia because I'm not like a famous person but um, that I was actually considered for the role that Susan Smith uh, played and they uh -huh. wanted me to play the role initially but I had did not have any film experience so uh, they, they gave it to, to Susan Smith mm -hmm. because uh, she had done a horror film before, I guess, or <laughs> get a few under her belt. I'm not sure. She had those crazy blue eyes. I have, like, big brown eyes, and she's got, like, big blue eyes. Yeah. So, like, but, uh, yeah, they were originally considering me for the lead, but I didn't have any experience. I was too new. Oh. Uh, so, like so, Gwyneth instead. <laughs> yeah, so you were almost her role then. I almost got to play whatever her character was. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but yeah, I was too, I was too young. I was too new. I did, I, that was my first movie. You, you probably at that age didn't know who Bird Eye Gordon was yet. I didn't. He, you know, apparently he had done a few films and, uh. Oh, more than a few films. He, this was probably yeah. his 20th film or something by that point. You know, he was the. Was it really? He was like one of the top three great low budget horror sci-fi filmmakers from the 50s to the 80s. Oh my gosh! He's on that list with Jack Hill and Roger Corman. You know, he made all the creature feature classics like The Amazing Colossal Man, Village of the Giants, The Food of the Gods, 
uh, it goes on and on. Wow. See, I mean, I knew you'd know, you would know way more. <laughs> yes, if it makes you uncomfortable, I apologize. <laughs> What's that? If it oh, makes not you... at all. Okay. It's a riot. I was hoping I would learn more from you. That <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, it was like, okay, I did that. I moved on. But I just remember he was he was a real sweetheart. Yeah. Person. I remember his wife at the time. She was a lot younger than he was. But <laughs> yeah, those guys, those low budget guys. Oh my God, they yeah. they have very questionable uh, sexual relations. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was that a trend with a lot of these guys? That seems to be the trend. Oh yeah, especially in the seventies when they're making you know uh, lots of TNA movies. You know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. She would definitely may have been in one of those. <laughs> yes. Um, right. What do you remember about the producer Alan Landsberg? Gosh, I don't remember anything about Alan Lindbergh. Yeah, that's... Well, I remember him being around, but I don't remember... I had a huge crush on his daughter, Valerie Landsberg, when I was a kid, and I'm trying to get her on here, <laughs> and yeah. hopefully it's going to happen this year. That is so funny. <laughs> no, yeah. and you still haven't met her? No, uh, we've just we've been at, interacting on social media for the last year. She's been super busy. Hopefully it's going to happen this year, because you know, I was a big Fame fan growing up. Oh, she was in Fame? Oh, she was the best actress on that show. You know, she was Doris. You know, the first uh, four seasons, she was Doris. And then she had to leave because oh. I guess her alcoholism caught up to her. Oh, oh Fame, the TV show, not the movie. Yeah, no, no. Um, Maureen Teefy was Doris in the movie, and I've talked to her. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Bert's still alive, by the way. He turned 100 last September. Oh, my gosh. No way. Yeah. Wow. I'd like to wow. get get him on here, but his website doesn't exist anymore, and so there's no contact info. He's not even on social media. Wouldn't that be amazing? That would be, yeah. yeah. But I guess it's not meant That's to be. Amazing. Wow, that is so interesting that he's still alive. I, I was so grateful. I remember, you know, now looking back, mm -hmm. I see how incredibly kind and patient um everybody was like they mm -hmm. were real pros even though it was like it was a you know a b film yeah they they mm -hmm. were so good with um with us as like these new to the scene you know never been in a movie kind of before yeah um mm -hmm. group I, I was actually in the movie with me and it happened to be my best friend at the time, my best friend Judy. We were also, we were we played best friends in the movie. She's the other girl on the bus. Mm -hmm. I'm the dark haired. I don't know if you know what I look like. but I know what you look like. <laughs> I'm the Italian. Yeah. <laughs> and she was my little friend. I look like that, except that I'm a little older. Not much different, actually. Just a few more lines. Um, but yes, yeah, she was actually my best friend uh, in real life at the time, too, my friend Judy. Oh, she's together. You don't talk to her no more. I haven't talked to her, um, but we have a mutual friend mm -hmm. uh, who mentioned that he was in touch with me recently, but she didn't seem that interested. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. She got she got very religious. Oh, she married a very religious. Yes, yeah, she's not really. I don't know. I don't see her anymore. Sadly. Be, be, being that you were as young as you were, what did you think of the con a concept of, you know, old Pilgrim, Massachusetts coming back in modern day? Um, I, you know, I don't think uh, I had the wherewithal to see that that was mm -hmm. uh, actually a pretty interesting concept. I did watch the movie. It was a few years ago. It wasn't terrible, actually. It was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Um, the whole flashback into her, like, a past life type of a thing that whoever she was and the whole uh, witch trials. Um, and I ended up, interestingly, I ended up doing a play, not musical, about Anne Hutchinson, uh, in, also in Boston, uh, when I was, I guess, not 18 or 19. It wasn't too long after that. Um but, you know, if you look at it now, mm -hmm. actually it was a really interesting idea, interesting story. It was compelling. I don't think I saw it when I was making the movie. I think I was more interested in, like, 
how they were going to kill the teacher and, you know, what, what they were going to show. And yeah. if we get killed, you know, <laughs> <laughs> how that all works out. Um, I don't think I had enough vision to see that that was an interesting subject. How about you? What did you think of it? I thought it was pretty original, you know. It was... Um it was it was pretty interesting because you know instead of you know making references to um, you know the pilgrim stealing from the Indians for Thanksgiving you know instead it was a swipe at the Salem witch trial and this was pre hocus pocus yeah you know yeah definitely it was more along the like the scarlet letter kind of a you know it's more just yeah. I had to look at it now to see if it was, like, misogynist in any way. I don't really know. I, I didn't get that sense, really. Um, it seemed like a, a pretty compelling story. Probably should have watched it again before talking to you, but I didn't have time. <laughs> I, I, I watched it the other night. Oh, yeah. You're, it's fresh in your mind. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just wish someone would uh, make a new transfer on the DVD because it, it was a real dated like copy on 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 youtube but um yeah i mean the movie opens with a, a medieval torture beheading and right. <laughs> i thought that was pretty funny and i love how yeah. the class goes on a field trip to the museum i spent a lot of time in yeah. museums throughout my school years you know so yeah. i love how I like that scene, i was in that scene i did a, i did some, i remember being there at that museum yeah, I just love how, you know, um, the the spell is unleashed there, you know, of all places. We see her, yeah. <laughs> Susan Swift um, was coming off of Audrey Rose. What was she like to work with? Audrey Rose? Who? Uh, uh, Susan Swift. Susan Swift. She was very quiet. You know, she was very quiet. I don't know if she was just very, you know sort of Stanislavski, you know, yeah. <laughs> she was just really getting into her character. Um, but she was not, you know, she wasn't like funny, joking around on the set kind of a person at all. She was extremely quiet. No, she's, herself. she's a, she's a right wing attorney now, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> no way. No, oh, yeah. Susan, stop. That's too bad. Oh, well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, that's a bummer. Wow. Mm. Oh, that's a bummer. <laughs> did you? Did you? Did so you get? Did how? You, how is quiet and reserved uh, mm. on obvious choice for being a right wing attorney? <laughs> yeah. Well, we're not going to go there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> She's. You don't. You don't mm. want her on this show. <laughs> no. No. Fair enough. She, she's pretty eerie, though, when she commands the dog to follow her, and that spider tentacle comes out of her ear. Oh my God! I was like, "Wow! I can't believe they did that." <laughs> yeah, there was some pretty good um, special effects. It wasn't. I mean, they're funny. You can see that it's you know they're they're you know special effects. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's the kind of horror movie that I can actually watch because I'm actually a. Um, kind of a, a bit of a wuss. I can't really watch scary movies, but that one, because it's funny. I mean, it's funny and mm -hmm. gross. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I, now that you're telling me all the, all the movies that he actually made, I can see how he had a certain genre that way. Yeah. He's kind he, of hyperbolic, um, you know. Right. Horror film. Yeah, I mean, they don't make movies. They don't make horror movies anymore with possessed little girls. It's a shame, you know. Back then, you had yeah, it really <laughs> Poltergeist, The Exorcist, The Brood, um, Kathy's Curse. Oh. All that stuff was great. Well, look what happened to Linda Blair. I mean, she wasn't the same. Like they really, they kind of messed her up. I met, I met her. She's mean. I'll tell you. Really? Is yeah. she? Yeah, she's got that image of like you know I'm a real humanitarian, but she's mean, really. Wow. I always thought, like, she, you know, she was just damaged goods. You know, like, they just... I think she is, but <laughs> just she just has no respect for her fans. And she just does, you know, so she can collect money for her, you know, animal, you know, shelter campaign thing or whatever. You know, it's just like, it's a waste of time. Why don't you just do it, you know, through the mail instead of just being mean to fans? Oh, that's a bummer. Yeah. That's such a 
Oh, wow. So you really have reached out to quite a lot of people. I mean, I saw from your podcast, there's quite a few. I've gone to conventions over the last seven years. I've experienced these real Zelig-like moments in showbiz. And, you know, I did stamp <laughs> comedy for 10 years before that. I mean, I've, I've, I've seen a lot of stuff. Wow. That's really, it's really fun. I mean, it sounds really fun, but I'm sure you run into a few, a few beauty boots. Yeah. Out there. All that's going to be nice. all that's going to be chronicled in my memoir. Yeah, right. <laughs> I got. I've been, I've been working I'd on like that. I like to read that. That sounds great. Yeah, I've been working on that for the last two years. I need to get back to it because I took a long break because I cried a lot. I put a lot of stuff down that I'd never even told anybody before. Wow. Yeah. So in like like now I'm like really curious like why like it was like you're crying you know and through what you've been doing as far as being a fan? No, just that, telling deeply personal that, stories. That or just your life? <laughs> no, I just told deeply personal stories about my childhood that I had never told anybody. I told it on paper, and it was just really sad for me to get it out. Yes, yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah. That's amazing, but what a wonderful thing to do. I mean, cathartic, I'm hoping that it's helping, too. It will, it will when I get back to it, because I just need to, you know, take a break and then just, you know, deal with it and just get back to it, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, I uh, I write and journal a lot about mm-hmm. my childhood, my child's childhood, but I have also a therapist to keep me. I tried that once. It didn't work for me. Yeah, yeah. Wow, well, maybe the writing will. Maybe it will help. Yeah. And I think it helps to, to write your story. Like I, write, I like to write in the sense that hopefully my story will help other people, you know, feel less alone in that sense, you know. Yeah. Now, some acting legends were in the movie. Uh, Albert saw me and uh, yeah. Guy Stockwell. Did you get to interact with them? Albert saw me, I did. Mm-hmm. Uh, who was the other actor you said? Guy Stockwell. I don't think I met Guy. <coughs> no, but Al- Albert Salmi was a love. Mm-hmm. Just a sweetheart, yeah. He looks like it, yeah. I am just a sweetheart of a man, yeah. Guy Stockwell, I've been told, was a great guy. Actually, a, a little bit nicer than his brother, Dean. Um, even though I heard yeah. Dean was a great guy, too. But it, I just, I guess it just depends on, on who you talk to. But... Guy Stockwell played Bo Jest in 1966 in the remake of the uh, old Gary Cooper movie. Wow, I did not know that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. Re- I don't recall being with him, but I do remember. Uh, um, yeah, he was a. He was he was a genuine pro. He was like you know a real pro. Like he was he would, like set an example. Albert saw me. He was he was like the dude. He was like the the star. Uh, on the set that really set a lovely example for us. I do remember that. I think we only filmed for our section of the film was like three weeks. Wow. Yeah, it was just a few days here and there. The film, like the scenes on the bus and then the scenes in the in the museum. I know. I, 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 when I saw the bus, I was like, that's her or that's Therese? <laughs> <laughs> Yep. Yeah. I, it's so weird. It's like a, you know, it's like a different life. It's just like a, a we, I, it's funny because I work in a different school. I work in two different schools. One I do, I work in one, um, one of my jobs is that I work with, I do musical theater with people with disabilities. Yes. I love that. Yeah. It's, it's wonderful. Um, and then I have another job where I work in a, like kind of a crunchy granola the opposite of a right-wing lawyer school. Um, <laughs> and uh, one of the, the staff asked a question. It was right it was right before you contacted me, which I thought was really interesting. And his question was, um, it was like an icebreaker question in a staff meeting, which it was, what, tell us about your, your first two jobs and what you learned from them. And interestingly enough, my second real job was that movie. You know, I think I worked at York Steakhouse, Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, um, you know, did a couple of things and 
And that was, uh, that was my real first job in a career that I ended up having for 27 years. I, I, did, I was in show business for, up until my son uh, was two and diagnosed with autism. Yeah, I have Asperger's, which I'll get into in a little bit. But um, did you go to the rap party or a screening for the movie? Oh, yes. Yes, yeah. I did. I have to tell you the thing that stood out at the rap party at the end of our... Well, we had a rap party at, I think it... I don't think it was for the whole movie. Was it for the whole movie? I don't remember. Maybe it was. But we did go to the rap party. Mm-hmm. And I remember somebody kissing me. And either he, either he didn't remember that you don't have to stick your tongue in the mouth of the person that you're kissing. <laughs> <laughs> he forgot that you don't have to do that. Mm-hmm. He just did that. And I don't remember who it was. It was this big guy. He was kind of nerdy, tall, skinny guy. He was one of the grips or, you know, I'm not sure, a lighting guy. I can't remember. And uh, I remember kind of coming away with that, like, Thinking, of, was that okay? Because I don't think there wasn't no, it was no Me Too situation going on there. And probably mm-hmm. even then, I think it was pretty innocent. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I do, I do remember that stood out from the at the at the rap party. <laughs> yeah. I actually, I also, I have a photograph somewhere. It's here somewhere, um, and it's a picture of mm-hmm. me and my friend. Judy and I'm pretty sure Bert. Yeah. Give us and one other guy, this tall guy with blonde hair. The bo- uh, I'm pretty sure I have that photo. It's a very faded mm-hmm. you know, 1980s little wear photo that I still have somewhere. The, the, the movie got like a limited theatrical run, but CBS played it and Universal released it, which I thought was interesting. Wow, wow. Yeah. Where was it? This all happened. <laughs> you were living your I life. I don't know if you saw that that was me. <laughs> <laughs> you were living your life is what you were doing. I guess so. You were in yeah. you, you were in first affair after that. I was. I was in a very small mm-hmm. role in first affair. <clears throat> I forgot about that. Mm-hmm. Well, I think I had like one line. Wait, was that the one that Sidney Poitier? No, uh, Gus Trinkinus uh, directed it from West Side Story. Right, yes. And yes. Melissa Sue Anderson, Loretta Swit, Amanda Bierce when she was super young. Yep. Yeah, I didn't see any of those guys. I was in the scenes with all the boys. With the bo- the I can't remember who they were. They were uh, oh, I remember. What's his name? Matt Dillon? Was that first affair? Let me look it up. Matt Dillon in that? Oh, were you in a movie with Matt Dillon? I remember he was in one of those movies. I'm pretty sure that, I thought that was first affair. No, it was Joel Higgins. There was Joel Higgins, there was Robert Curtis Brown, Charlie Lang. Um, That's it for the, like, the men. Yeah, I don't remember that. No, they were, were, you know, it was a a brat pack of its own. There okay. were a couple of people, but I don't. Yeah, that wasn't a big thing. But I did. I did another movie with where that Sidney Poitier directed, and I, I got to have. Oh, was that Fast Forward? Is that what that was called? The dance movie. I don't remember. I don't remember it being a dance movie, but I we did these scenes. It was outside. We stir we, crazy. We, what was it called? Stir Crazy, Hanky Panky. Um, I, think it, I think it was Hanky Panky. With Gene Wilder and Gilda Radner. No, no, that wasn't it. Okay. Ghost Dad? I don't remember the title. Ghost Dad? I don't remember this. With Bill Cosby? <laughs> no, no, it definitely wasn't with Bill Cosby. But, well, the thing is, they could have been in it. I don't know. I was only fil- I only got to film one day, but I'll tell you something. Mm-hmm. I had one day with Sidney Poitier. Uh-huh. And it, it was, like, mind-blowing. I don't know what it was about this man. He was just, took my breath away. Mm-hmm. He was one of these people. Because I remember also I, I met Paul Newman, and I had the same feeling about Paul Newman. It was just these beautiful people. Like, he was just so stunning. How'd you meet Paul Newman? I met Paul Newman when I moved to New York, and I worked at the Russian Tea Room. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't do a movie with him. Nice. <laughs> I was working at the Russian Tea Room, 
and uh, I got to take his credit card, and the man glowed in the dark. He was just, just, just wow. It was just some people. I met, a, I met a few people there because a lot of famous people used to come in there for lunches. I, I, I only got the job there because I, I saw the movie Tootsie, I think, and I said, oh, I think I'll go for a job, apply for a job at the Russian TV. Mm-hmm. Um, but he was just one of those people, and Sidney Poitier was one of those people where you just, there's just something about them. They have a certain presence that is unusual. Uh, and I just remember because I, I was looking at the New York Times, the year in pictures, I think. Or it was Who Died This Year. Was that with Sidney Poitier? Yeah, he died. Uh, I was thinking about him. Yeah. Paul, but yeah, anyway. Paul Newman died in 2008. He died a long time ago, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I, I found out. Had, uh, go ahead. Subject. Oh, but that may have been maybe. So I don't remember. I, so I guess that wasn't the movie with Matt Dillon. I did another movie with Matt Dillon. Was it uh, Rex or Tex? I need little people. Or little darlings or my bodyguard or any of those. It was probably little darlings, like one of those. You know, yeah. he was really young. Christy McNichol. I met her like a month before the pandemic, and she was a sweetheart. Christy McNichols, right? Remember Family? What was it called? Family? That, yeah, that Family. Show? It was called Family. <laughs> so cool. I just, I I never, just love her. I never saw Family. I watched her on Empty Nest, and I watched um, Little Darlings and um, Just the Way You Are, where she's disabled and she can't yeah. find love. Yeah. That movie always touched me because growing up disabled, yeah. like it always you know, made me feel like I wasn't alone. Oh my gosh, yeah. Yeah, I used to really love her. She was like, the, I, was, I would definitely be a fan. Yeah. For Christy McNichol, for sure. That's so great. And she was still, she was a really nice person still. Yeah. I mean, I had heard that she was a diva on sets, but that was only because of her bipolar disorder that, that, that emerged later, you know. But... <clears throat> oh my God! I I made her and her manager laugh out loud because I'm really good at at telling dirty jokes and writing them. <laughs> you know, I've been a, you know because I was a comedian for ten years, and like me and her manager are like Facebook friends, right? And she posts dirty jokes all the time, and I make her laugh and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, that is so cool. That is really great. It's so good to know. I worked with another actor who I can say is a really nice. Person. I worked with Steve Carell. I did summer stuff with Steve, Steve Carell. And just oh. so you know, he's also a really great guy. I was obsessed with the Forty Year Old Virgin when it came out. I just started doing stand up <laughs> at that time. I, I found like I found I found myself almost like that character. So I I was trying to find an angle for it in my stand up without people thinking that I was ripping it off, you know, and. <laughs> It, it didn't work the way I wanted it to, but fortunately, once I, I started, you know, um, dating and after I lost weight, then I had something to, like, you know, joke about, and I kind of dropped that persona. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Very necessary. Yeah. 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 I found this out in the most unlikely of places. Okay, I was on... Um, Yahoo Images, and I was trying to find a, a good picture of you, and there wasn't any. And I found this this picture that was taken from a production you did of No No Nanette in high school. <laughs> it was t- and it was taken from eBay. Some guy was selling that picture on eBay. I don't know where it came from. Isn't that crazy? Somebody contacted me about a year ago, maybe it was two years ago, yeah. and told me about that picture that he was trying to sell them. And my friend Russ Gallagher, who I would, he's, he's next to me, he yeah. plays the, the lead, the other one. Yeah. Um, and we actually got, we contacted each other because of that photograph. Yeah. Oh my God. Was that play fun to do? That was my senior year in high school. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It was fun. Um, I learned how to tap dance. Um, my senior year was not my I was not my best year. Yeah. <laughs> I was going through something. I don't know what I was going through. Um, but it was a, it was a fun show. Uh, we did a lot of that. Was at the high school that did some really great shows. And my and my favorite person who was who I have to get in touch in touch with and tell him what I'm doing now because of him. You know, my high school drama teacher Rick Sosny. Yeah. Um, he was. You know, it's still, it's like he's the inspiration for, I 
still feel like what I'm doing right now. Um, oh, that's wonderful. Because of him, my, my son grew up, you know, watching Gene Kelly. We call him, we call him Gene Kelly Wolfstorff. I got Gene Kelly's widow coming on soon. Oh, wow, yeah. She's, she's interesting. She, she, she's been known to not be terribly nice, too. I hope she's nice to you. Yeah, she... Very possessive. She's very possessive of his, uh, what do they call that? His legacy. Yes. Um, we were supposed to do it December 30th, and then she told me she got COVID while traveling, and... I don't know, she didn't seem 100% interested in doing the interview, you know, but if, if it gets to the point where she continues not to, I just won't do it. But I, I really wanted to talk about his movies because I love uh, For Me and My Gal and Singing in the Rain and all of that stuff. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, my son, absolutely. <laughs> my son, you know, he. I, I have to say, like, Gene Kelly was like his mentor because of him. You know, we've had many, many pairs of tap shoes and... Mm-hmm. And and hung on many lampposts. Mm-hmm. Um, just adore him. I think he was a brilliant, brilliant artist. Uh, mm-hmm. So yeah, I do hope he gets to speak with her. We went to the dance museum, which is uh, up in Albany, and Saratoga. sorry, Saratoga. Um, and Gene Kelly didn't have anything there. I was like, wait a minute. We walked through this whole dance museum, and there's no sign of Gene Kelly. And it was because. She wouldn't allow, you know, for any of his uh, images, I guess, to be in the in the museum. And I was like, "What a shame!" Because then now people are not learning about who he is. I know it's. So. I know there's there's a couple of people out there. I know that Earl Flynn's daughter is the same way, and um, mm. I'm sure other people. But it, it's it's weird, you know, like you know. The, this this whole movement of political correctness has taken over to the point where John Wayne's statue is removed because of all the racist comments he made in the movies. And it's like that's how oh, it, that's how it was. Me. That's how it was back then. Not just in the movies, yeah. but like in the eighteen hundreds. That's how they talked. You know, it's it's. Yes, it is. Yeah. They're trying to erase history. It's sad. You know, it's tricky with that <clears> because <throat> you know, very similar with mm. books and you know, libraries and schools, which you know, I I. I and it's like, at what point do you also want to say, okay, this is what it was, um, and, you know, we don't do that anymore. Isn't that a great... And Because and, you have to also have to see where we've come from, you know, and look at that as, oh, there's a line in the sand, but you can't just erase the fact that it happened. You know? Right. <laughs> it doesn't make him a bad person. Yeah. That's, that's a shame. So is there anything on IMDb that they didn't, they didn't put that maybe you were in? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know what's on IMDb. Just, <laughs> do just, I, I have an IMDb? I do. That's just, amazing. Just the uh, the coming and first affair. But you mentioned that Matt Dillon first movie. Affair was with, that's right. That was with Loretta Swift. That's right. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, just, those, okay. just those two movies. But there's a Matt Dillon one. And uh, Sidney Poitier, uh, and then was there anything yeah. else? No, no. The rest of my stuff was, uh, I did commercials. I just did a lot of television commercials and voiceovers. Um, that's how I made my living. And, you know, on the side I would do, like, I, I was, you know, in a in a musical version of Medea. Trust me, you wouldn't have wanted to see that. <laughs> uh, we all know how that ends. And, um, no, I, I mostly made my living, I made money doing uh, television commercials and voiceovers and, um, you know, little things and, and, and singing, uh, at, uh, at BMI with, uh, all the up and coming, uh, songwriters. <laughs> uh, so that was that. And then, you know, I got married and, and I gave birth to Gene Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> with autism, and so I changed my career path, which how, I'm happy. How, how many years have you been in New York now? Um, let's see, I moved to New York when I was, I think, 20, so okay. 40 years. So can we, that's easy math. Wow, so you were there with 9-11 and all that stuff? I was, yep, yep. Wow. I was there, I was there... 2001, I'll never forget it. I'll never forget exactly what I was doing. Exactly, I wasn't in the city, though. I was living in Westchester. I was about 40 minutes outside the city mm-hmm. when, that was ha- when that happened. But I had lots of friends in the city. 
So yeah, uh, yeah, that was that was quite a moment. Yeah. And where are you? You're out in California, right? Yes, born and raised. Oh wow! What part of what part of California? Born and raised in San Francisco. Moved up to Redding six years ago because uh, my mother and I fell into hard times, and. Wow. We've been here ever since, hoping to move somewhere, anywhere but here. Um, it's a horrible place to live, uh, Reading. There's just no fun here, and people are way too conservative for us. There's that word again, conservative. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you're not. I'm not either. <laughs> yeah. Good I can agree to disagree with people, but when you try to indoctrinate, that's when you lose me. I just cannot stand yeah. people who try to indoctrinate. I, I do everything I can to avoid uh, people like that as much as possible because I don't do that, you know. No, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's crazy time. Yep. So your son is 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 why um, you started becoming an advocate for autism, and it just you 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 found your true calling in that? Yeah, it was kind of an epiphany because um, I saw that uh, there are people who have disabilities who are also really talented. Mm -hmm. And uh, I felt like there needed to be actual meaningful opportunities for people in the creative arts field. And it just so happens that my background is in theater and television and film, and um, it was it, he was really the inspiration behind uh, me doing it myself. Because originally, I just looked. I thought, well, there, there's got to be something out there for young adults and um, people who want to express themselves through the arts. Um, and I couldn't find anything. <laughs> it was crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, they'd have like little. You know, they'd be. Uh, crafty things. And my son is also an artist. He's a sculptor. Um, but um, there wasn't any real meaningful theater. It was, you know, very shallow. And I wanted to do real music with them. So I and eventually found uh, a music therapist who I was working with at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was like, let's do this. And so we started, uh, we opened up initially uh, a theater program and now the theater program has expanded quite a bit, and now what we have is an integrated program where the uh, our people are working alongside professionals on stage. So it's, a, it's, it's professional actors working with our uh, people with disabilities and all abilities on mm -hmm. stage, and that for me was a dream come true. I love that. John Travolta's um, brother has a camp um, uh, where he teaches uh, disabled kids how to act. Awesome. That's great, yeah. I, I just love yeah. that stuff. I wish, because we didn't have those programs when I was a kid. Otherwise, I'd be yeah. a working actor now. But I just, I don't like the business side of acting. So I just yeah. never really fully pursued it. I mean, I've been in stuff. I've been in music videos and stuff. But I just don't like mm -hmm. the bullshit of the business. Me too. Me too. That's why it wasn't, I wasn't terribly sad to not be uh, in it anymore in that sense. And now to be working with this, group of actors is so fulfilling because it's their dream too and it's not just prima donnas you know right, right. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not that cutthroat ego <laughs> there's a lot you have to have a strong ego to sustain it's, and, you know a, a career in that business you really do and and i don't think i was really cut out for it that way i kind of pr discovered that i prefer to be in the background and be directing and to direct this group of people and to see how much they grow and what they uh, what you know what what they get back from it, like how much it nourishes and inspires them, is like better than you know any any payment you know I could possibly have. I mean, this year for me was a total epiphany. Mm -hmm. You know that fact that we we've, we've actually arrived and now we're doing uh, this this combination of collaborating with professionals uh, and, they, and the people the professional actors who are working with us get so much out of it as well you know, it really is just it's just a, it's just a joy it's just total joy so I get to do what I love to do mm -hmm. in a, a wonderful environment so it's, yeah but yeah I agree with you tough business not easy at all. I, I spent 10 years in special ed because I have Asperger's and 
I've, I've always been diagnosed with a learning disorder, but I know I have Asperger's because I, I see other people with it. I'm like, yeah, I'm definitely like that in many ways. Yeah. Do you have a community that you talk with? Because a lot of, there are, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I can be talking out of my butt. I don't. I'm very uncomfortable being around other people of, of disabilities. It's not because of mm-hmm. superiority or anything like that. It's just, I just, I'm, I'm just uncomfortable because when I was in school, I was around people who I thought were, were more normal than I was in special ed class, right? Mm-hmm. And then I had to be in these, um, at the, uh, I had to be in a group home during me and my mom's homeless times when we fell under homeless, mm-hmm. when we fell under homeless times. And I was in there with people who had far worse disabilities than I did. And it made me very uncomfortable because it made me think, oh, is this the way you see me? You know? Right. It yeah. was just, yeah. it, was, it was awful. It was it's just yeah. awful. Yeah. No, I mean, I have friends who are, you know, halfway normal. And <laughs> I, I, yeah. talk to, I talk to them, I hang out with them and all that stuff, you know. And that's all I need, really. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know there are some people with Asperger's who like to be around other people with Asperger's because they feel like, you know, they get me, you know, kind of a thing. Exactly. Um, it may not be that way for everybody. Exactly. And, you know, I, and I complained about this stuff, too. I was like, you know, is this the way you see me and stuff? And it's like, well, if you, mm-hmm. I know you're only here temporarily, but, you know, you have to kind of get with our program and stuff and do this and do that. And... Thank yeah. God I'm back with my mom again. We have a home. We have a, a, a roof over our head. Amazing. Yeah, but it's not in a place that you're very happy. That's too bad. Just a, Yeah, just a town. That's all. There's lots of fires yeah. up here. And when the storms happen, they happen. I mean, my, my phone line um, cut out uh, with my first interview I did today. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's how bad it this is. This podcast is a pretty cool thing. It's, a re- it's really cool, So. It has been just a godsend, and it's just been it's been a godsend to the world in general. I mean, everyone's doing them now, you know. I, am. I know, right? You're really you're really riding the wave, which is great, and it's such a great subject. It's really fun, like what you're what you're doing and finding these interesting actors. Like, wow! I mean, I saw the list of people, and I was thinking, man. I'd rather talk to yeah. journeymen than stars, though, because they got the best stories, yeah. and they're a lot more humble. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can totally see that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's fun as a journeyman to talk about it, you know. Yeah. So how long have you yeah. had There You Art Studios? So it's actually now, it's, it's Music for Life Creative Art mm-hmm. Therapy now, because now I've, I've teamed up with um, this other, uh, this other, uh, this, this, this music therapist. Mm-hmm. So it's music for like creative arts therapy now. It's not there. You art studios was the working title um, because um, it was something my son used to say to me all the time. He'd say, "Mom, say there you are." You know, I would always have to say, "There you are," and then <laughs> yeah. um, so I called it there you are. It was just a working title. But it we've been doing the theater program. I believe this is our sixth year of, for the theater program. Mm-hmm. And it's just busting out of the scenes. There's not we we moved from a little studio into uh, a six studio center, and it's too small. And I knew it would be this way because there's there's a need. Like I I felt for again like meaningful creative uh, art uh, for people to really be able to you know uh, express in a meaningful way, a viable, meaningful way. So now we have not just the theater program, we have a visual arts program, we have a TV show, which I'm going to be working on starting next week. We have podcasts. It's, 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 a, it's a bustling uh, creative arts center now. Yes, yeah, it's been, it's been sure. That is wonderful. You're doing God's work. You know that, right? You know what? I agree. You know, and and I'm not even like I'm not like a religious person, but if, but yeah, that would be. I do feel that way. I feel like um, like this is why I'm here. You know, um, yeah. And uh, like I said, I get I get so much more in return, and I'm so grateful to my son. As hard as it is, and as hard as it has been for us, and oftentimes for him, mm-hmm. I'm so grateful to him for 
uh, how much, you know, what, uh, you know, the person that I am because of him. Uh, so, and for him inspiring me to do this. Yeah, best that, thing ever. That is way so, better. That is so, so beautiful. I, I love hearing that, Therese. I really do. So do you have anything upcoming that you'd like to uh, promote? Well, um, if you want to, if anybody wants to, you know, they can look up uh, Music for Life Creative Arts Therapy. If you want to look it up and see our, our all of our programs, you can see our shows and watch the movies of our shows. We just did Elf. That was the... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it was pretty freaking great. I have to say, it was such a blast. Um, um, but I'm, I have to, I still have to um, put together. Uh, we weren't allowed to film the whole thing because it was a full licensed show. Uh, so I'm going to be putting together a video of clips from the show. But it was so much fun. Um, but you can see all of the videos of our shows there, and the artwork, and the TV shows on our uh, on our website, Music for Life Creative Arts Therapy. Wonderful. Uh, I would, I would definitely throw that out there. If you want to get inspired, go ahead and have a look at that. <laughs> Wonderful. Can I tell you a joke real quick? Yes, please. What do you call a boy that doesn't masturbate? Oh my God, that's terrible. <laughs> Depressed. <laughs> a liar. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> yep. That's a good one. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, people like it. They're always trying to guess the punchline. Depressed, you know, a loser. All these different kind of, <laughs> all these different kind of mean punchlines. <laughs> yep. No, you're definitely right. That's true. <laughs> oh, uh, gosh. Well, Therese, thank well. you so much for coming on and having this wonderful thank chat you. here. Thank you, Tommy. I really, really enjoyed meeting you over the phone, and I wish you and your mom all the best and keep going with what you're doing. It's really great. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I, I, I've made a lot of friends in New York through this podcast. If I ever get to go, I'll let you know. Yes, please. I'd love to meet up with you. That would be wonderful. Okay. Anytime. Happy New Year and be safe out there. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Therese Giamarco, ain't she a sweetheart? Oh, a true Italian Bostonian, if ever there was one. And she's doing God's work, like I said. And what a wonderful lady, huh? I'm so glad that we got to talk tonight. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Player dudes.